Hey everyone. After the success of the Black Queer Town Hall and STEM event, I decided to sit down one more time with Dr. Dick Schwab to talk about gender and sexuality from birth. Dr. Schwab is an esteemed and accomplished writer, professor, and scientist from Europe. His work has been cited thousands of times and published even more. You should definitely check out some of his writings and form your own opinion. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that he does use the word transsexual interchangeably with transgender, which is not necessarily how I would describe the entire trans community, but I obviously understand the purpose of his words. And I also understand that the terminology, while I may consider it outdated, is still effective. And so hopefully you'll be able to get something out of this conversation, whether or not it is the exact terminology that you would use or are used to hearing when people are referencing the transgender community. Please know that the essence and the overall goal of our conversation is to demonstrate that we are who we are from birth and that people in the trans community can benefit from this information and as well as people outside of the trans community. So with that being said, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Dick Schwab. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the, I guess, extended cut bonus of Black Queer Town Hall in STEM event that we had. And we uh, had just had such a wonderful time exploring the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with Black queer folks and scientists that we wanted to really continue the conversation. Uh, ultimately, the world of science and technology, the world of STEM is a world for everyone. And I think the, the goal was to make sure that Black queer folks felt seen and heard in the conversation. One important piece of that conversation that just relates to science and technology and engineering and mathematics, th there's always some part of STEM that really does relate back to our everyday lives. And for me, one of the most interesting uh, aspects of science, I guess you can say, is you know sexuality and gender. This is something that's been high in debate for, for many years, but especially in the past several years, uh, past four years in particular. And, you know, we've heard a lot from different, different places, different sources, a lot of misinformation. One of the things that's really interesting is that at least in the United States, and I think abroad as well, when we hear laws and rules being put into place that are restriction that are restrictive of LGBTQ people, many of the people that are purporting these laws, creating these laws, passing these policies and putting them in place, use either religion and or some type of science as their excuse, uh, claiming that, you know, being gay or queer is not natural, being trans is you know, is a psychological disorder. And, and so here we have the, the preeminent scientist, in my, uh, hardly in my opinion, <laughs> to who has done some absolute, uh, some crucial and vital work and published uh, some very, not only interesting, but honestly life saving. Uh, research just to address some of these things. And so it's with my, uh, it's my great honor to welcome back to the conversation after uh, a very lovely and very informative um, uh, presentation in Black Queer Town Hall STEM. I'm so happy to sit down with doctor and professor and scholar and writer, Dick Swab. Hello. Hello. And so thank you so much. I know we have some technical difficulties, so we're off to uh, a little bit of a slow start. But uh, you, th thank you first off for your presentation for uh, early, the first day of Black Queer Town Hall in STEM. It was fantastic. And I know a lot of people 
um, we're really excited to see the uh, sort of the nuts and bolts behind your uh, your work and to understand exactly the science behind what you say is very natural, human sexuality and gender. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that we were able to have a conversation together because that was more of a presentation. And for people who uh, may have missed it, you can go back and watch the first day of STEM, which we, uh, which we are airing currently on our Black Queer Town Hall YouTube. And so you can find the first day of STEM, you can find uh, Dr. Swab's uh, presentation on, um, on, I think it's the very first speech that we had. And so go and check it out and then um, you can come back and join this conversation if there's anything you didn't pick up. And so I'm just really happy to sit down and talk with you. Uh, I remember when we were first planning STEM, the Black Queer Town Hall STEM presentations and trying to figure out what we were going to have, who we were gonna have speak. I knew it was really important that if we're doing something with science and queerness, that we have someone, a scientist, someone who can speak to the science of being queer, being gay, being transgender. Um, and so how did you, I know that you've already covered this, but for people who are watching this video here and now, who might not have seen any of your other work, how did you end up coming into this realm? Uh, is this something that you discovered by accident? Is this something that you came across just routinely in all of your other work that you do on the human brain? What is the, what is the, the way that you discovered this and um, came across this research? Well, it, um, I, I was always interested in the question, uh, how come that, uh, uh, we, um, that our uh, sexual orientation is determined, our gender identity is determined, and by what factors are they determined? And um, animal experiments already indicated that sexual orientation was determined early in development of uh, animals by hormones that acted on the brain. And uh, so the logical step was to lo look into uh, human brains um, and see whether uh, similar um, uh, findings could be uh, obtained. And uh, for that purpose, we needed human brains of uh, mm -hmm. homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual, transsexual people. And uh, this was part of uh, the collection I started uh, in the Netherlands Brain Bank. So the Netherlands Brain Bank is collecting uh, human brain uh, after death. And the donors already uh, donate their brain uh, a long time uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, when uh, the uh, material is available to us, it is with permission to uh, do a brain autopsy and to study the brain and have all the clinical information that is needed to do a good study. And since I started the brain bank in uh, 85, we did four and a half thousand rapid autopsies and obtained brain tissue of people uh, which we consider to be controls, but also people with brain disorders. But uh, um, as a kind of side path, since my interest, I also collected uh, um, uh, brains with relevance to sexual differentiation. Uh, so it was all planned a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thankful that you did. I mean, I'm not sure how many people, of course, it must have, people who are in, involved in neuroscience, it must be uh, of interest <laughs> to find out what the human brain is doing. Obviously, that's the entire study. But the, as, I do find it really interesting that people who are not involved in science in any way, shape, or form use science just, the fa just using chromosomes and using sex at birth, 
basically genitalia. I think just those aspects mm -hmm. of biology to prove not only sex or gender, but also sexuality. And, and it's just really interesting and, and wonderful to hear that really uh, when, we're, when it comes to sexuality and gender, that this is some, there is, um, it is in the brain. It's our, our sexuality is not determined by our genitalia that we're born with. Meaning that someone born with a penis who's determined male isn't necessarily going to be heterosexual. And obviously that's like, seems as far as the science goes with people who are, I would say conservative, um, wanting to, to use science against people who are in the queer community. And so do you think that, um, okay, this is one, I'm, I'm, I want your help arming people who are watching this video to help us use whatever you have, whatever you know, to combat some of the people who are going to try to disprove us or, or create policies against us. Hopefully now that the United States has a different president coming in, we'll see less of this, but we could see more. Um, and so what do you say to people who say that there are only two genders? Well, um, what is important to note is that um, uh, variation is present in all our behaviors. And variation was the motor of evolution. So uh, whenever the environment changes, uh, by the variation, there are always individuals that could survive the rapid changes. And that's mm -hmm. the basic mechanism of, uh, of evolution. And we still have all the uh, variations, but uh, um, in my opinion, evolution also of the human brain has stopped, but we can discuss that separately. Um, mm -hmm. That is one important thing. So in, in anything you study, there's a huge variation. And the second point is that if you look to um, uh, differentiation of our sex organs and different sexual differentiation of the brain, they take place in different periods. So um, our uh, sex organs are differentiating in the first few months of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And our brain is differentiating sexually in the second half of pregnancy. And that means that those two processes can be influenced in a differential way. You can influence uh, the um, uh, differentiation of the sex organs without, different, uh, without uh, influencing differentiation of the brain and the other way mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. And that means that the two of them can also uh, uh, part in their development. And if mm -hmm. this is true, uh, then you would expect, in, for instance, in transsexuals, you would expect male structures in female brains and the other way around. And that's mm -hmm. indeed what we found. So uh, there are males and, and female structures in the brain. And uh, if you look in, in transsexuals, there was a reversal of uh, those structures. Mm -hmm. So we found indeed uh, male structures in female brains and the other way around. And uh, I know that those alterations, of course, they, they agreed with uh, the gender identity, the, we, the way mm -hmm. people felt uh, their identity, but they didn't uh, agree with the birth certificate, the passport. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to change that, of course. Um, I know that very early on, the... I don't really know, I don't know as much about this as I would like to partially because I don't read as much as I should. And there isn't that much, as far as I know, uh, extensive history and research on people in the trans community over time, um, at least not widely and, and not mainstream. Uh, but I do know that when I was starting my medical transition, it was explained pretty clearly to me by my doctors that the way to get around um, and to achieve, basically the, best, the only way to achieve what we want is to submit that I have a psychological disorder, gender dysphoria. 
which, you know, I think to many people just means that you're crazy. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and that you at, at most think that you are a woman, even though, you know, they say you're not and you were born this way or that way. And so do you think that is there, obviously there is, obviously if there's, if, if this is, our brains are connected to anything psychological, but is this science that you're, that you're presenting, does that take this one step further? Is, is there a difference between someone having a, a brain that is a quote female brain versus someone with a male brain who has a psychological disorder? Are those two things separate or how do you, how do we reconcile that? Yes. Um, uh... If, if I can um, uh, just proceed on, on your example, then we know from uh, some psychiatric patients having schizophrenia or bi- bipolar disorder that in some periods of the disease, they um, uh, have the conviction that they, they are of a different sex. Mm-hmm. Um, but that disappears again, and and that is then the psychological type of uh, uh, gender identity disorder. But uh, the mm-hmm. gender identity disorder in transsexuals is something that is hardwired in the brain, is uh, always present from uh, birth onwards, and mm-hmm. cannot be changed. Uh, also, not in in a uh, psychological uh, difficult period like uh, you see in uh, schizophrenia or in in bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. So it are two different things, and okay. uh, it's important for us because uh, if people want to uh, change their sex, so adapt it to their uh, gender identity as they feel it. You should exclude that uh, those people are schizophrenic or uh, have a bipolar disorder. It's a psychosis. Uh, Because uh, after that period, uh, that acute period, they they will think totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that that was, I remember my doctor just kind of saying, just go with it because it's the only way you're going to get your hormones and your surgery is just, you know. (laughs) And I was like, okay, I guess I've got this disorder. But I never felt that because I've always felt exactly the same. So I, 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 my life experience more closely aligns with um, what you're saying that my brain has always been hardwired the same way as this brain that I have that's a woman's brain. Um, Yeah. And And the same holds for sexual orientation. uh So, also, sexual orientation is hardwired. And of mm-hmm. course, um, uh, uh, the world has tried to change homosexual men in heterosexual men by all means, but uh, nobody has ever succeeded in that because it is hardwired in our brain uh, um, in the uh, period before birth. I think it's important for people to know that you know, the disclosure or coming out, the point at which that person, uh, whoever that individual comes out or talks about or even starts practicing uh, some of these different behaviors is only a point at which they are balancing feeling comfortable and confident to do that versus what's happening, the signals that they get from around them. And so people don't turn gay just because they tell you that they're gay when they're a teenager or a young adult. And the same thing that people don't turn into transgender people or transsexuals just because they disclose or have a certain surgery. Uh, Those surgeries are in fact the, the, the end of the process. And, you know, um, for many people in terms of, you know, that's their mind has already been made up because it was that way from the beginning. In terms of the, I mean, you know, people are, have been attacking queer people, gay people, historically, as long as we, as long as we know. But right now, it seems like the flavor of the, the month, Webster. Ah, the flavor of the month is uh, transgender people. 
and access to different different areas, restrooms, sports teams, organized sports. Um, and so one big argument right now and one big um, conversation that's happening is a lot of the restrictions that are being presented in particularly in women's sports, women's organized sports, either professional or at the school level in the United States and probably uh, internationally. There are people who say that trans women should not be able to participate in women's sports or in girls' sports because they are, quote, biologically men and more more advantaged uh, because they have I think there's a several reasons why they say why they say that. Um, it's either because they say that transgender women are really just men who are going to be sexual predators towards other girl towards other women and girls, or that they've had testosterone and been exposed to testosterone. So they're 20 times they're just super, super strength and going to take over the world if we allow them into women's sports. And so what is your response to that? And how do you sit with that? Yeah, it, it's really a an, an very difficult topic because um, uh, at the first place, uh, testosterone is increasing muscle mass and it makes mm -hmm. you stronger. Mm -hmm. So um, if you would uh, change into a woman and mm -hmm. keep uh, a source of testosterone, uh, then, of course, you are in an advantage. And mm -hmm. that's why um, there is a rule that uh, after, I think, uh, th three months or six months or so um, of uh, uh, the operation, it would be possible to uh, participate in the female sports. Mm -hmm. But there is another thing, and that is uh, that uh, testosterone in boys is already peaking the second half of uh, pregnancy. And that is changing our brain, but it might also change our uh, muscles. So mm -hmm. uh, whether you keep an, an advantage for the rest of your life uh, on the basis of the testosterone peak in uh, in, in um, fetal life, that is still not known. Mm -hmm. So it is a difficult topic. It is a difficult topic. It is a difficult topic. You know, I, I would imagine that, you know, I, I would argue that um, I am, you know, I certainly was exposed to testosterone <laughs> at some point, I think. Uh, and I certainly am taller. The, the secondary sex characteristics that uh, testosterone has permanently branded me with are very difficult for me to escape. The depth of my, the sound of my voice, the size of my body, things like that. But I would 100% argue, I don't even need to argue. Anyone who looks at me and knows me for two minutes would argue that I am 1000% less athletic than any woman who's ever played in any sport <laughs> ever <laughs> and <laughs> so you are no, no danger no danger yeah. for the Olympics no whatsoever. danger <laughs> in any way shape or form even if I had an yeah. interest in sports which I don't uh, my agility my ability I'm sorry to say um, is less than than any woman who is uh, an athlete and athletic uh, I would never play basketball against a woman or a man I would never lift weights against a woman or a man. Um, I'm going to lose. And so I, I believe that, you know, the, 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 when we're talking about sports, yes, there is a natural knack, but I think the natural selection of athletes versus people who are not naturally athletes overrules just people who have been who had testosterone because all humans i can't say i don't want to make a sweeping statement but generally humans whether regardless of what sex they are were born um or assigned at birth have been exposed to to hormones and so everyone has a relationship to hormones at, at some stage but 
the athletes, the people who go on to become Olympians are the ones who excel in spite of how they were born. The women who are, who are you know, winning the decathlon are doing things that ordinary women, everyday women, don't necessarily do because of their training and their interest in sports. And so I would argue that, you know, the sports arena, while it is a difficult subject and it's not quite so cut and dry or black and white, I do think that, you know, um, the, the, the sport will attract who, who, who's going to do well. And no one is going into to the Olympics because they want to be predators. And, you know, <laughs> I don't even watch the Olympics. No, it's, <laughs> no, it's uh, certainly it, it's not an, a reason to change your agenda. Because exactly. you want to participate in, in the Olympics. On the other hand, you can say that uh, in the Olympics, there are people that have extreme properties of some uh, um, hormones and receptors and muscles and, uh, well, whatever. Uh, it is all extreme. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. there is no fair uh, play in, in that sense. They are just extremes the ones mm -hmm. that uh, have the Olympic medals. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I wouldn't uh, mind so much to uh, uh, let, let uh, transsexuals participate if they really want to. Um, it's, it's so rare and, uh, well, Olympics is anyhow not fair because you are yeah. born with some uh, properties that are extreme. Exactly. Okay, I think that I think we can find common ground there. Uh, and so, do you think that we are? And this is just, I'm just curious to know your opinion on this. We are obviously we're obviously in a patriarchy. We're obviously coming from a history, or at least a recent history, modern history, of everything being gendered and binary. Um, personally, and then also societally. Do you think that moving towards a, socially moving towards um, spaces and practices and norms that are non-binary, gender non-specific, it would be advantageous to our society? Or do you think that keeping all of the sexes separate Male and female, separate, only those two. Do you think that that is what we're, what we're destined to do? Well, it, it would be advantage to uh, people. I, we, we don't uh, talk about society then, just uh, uh, mm -hmm. people uh, to uh, behave the way they want to behave. I always say um, that you, if you want to have a happy life, you should um, uh, adapt your life to the way your brain has developed. And that mm. uh, holds for your profession. It holds also for your sexuality and the way you behave in society. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see in, in the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, as you know, there was uh, the first uh, uh, same-sex marriage in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the first um, uh, transsexual clinics uh, um, in in Amsterdam, and now everything is more um, um, uh, common, commonly known, uh, more accepted. You see that uh, uh, it not only the extremes are coming to the clinic, but also everything in between. So there are people that uh, just want to uh, get rid of their breasts or people that just want to cross-dress and think it over. And once a year, uh, somebody is coming to my office and saying, well, this year I will change uh, my uh, sex. And uh, mm -hmm. he is now 67, and I think he will uh, um, be in doubt for the rest of his life because he is somewhere in the middle. He is not, neither uh, uh, mm -hmm. feeling that he is male or female. He is somewhere in the middle. And that's the variability I was talking about. Everything mm -hmm. is variable, and some people are put at extremes, and uh, uh, other people are put in the middle, and they come out now uh, um, 
because it's more accepted uh, that uh, there is variation. I do think that the key, I personally believe that the key to sort of enlightenment when it comes to sex, sexuality, and gender is making space for um, and really becoming comfortable with the, the the areas in between, the variant, as you're saying, people who are non-binary, um, people who are gender non-conforming, people who are bisexual or pansexual. And, and so have you seen, have you been able to account for any of those variants in the work that you've done in tr- with people's brains? Or has it been more to the extreme of, of gay versus straight or male versus female only? Now, if you start research, then you want to have extremes in order to be sure. Mm-hmm. And after that, uh, we can also study uh, people that are in between. And, and they are in between, uh, also in mm-hmm. characteristics in the brain. Um, mm-hmm. It should also be noted that uh, there are sex differences in that. In that mm-hmm. um, for instance, uh, in gay men, you find... In gay men, you find some 5% uh, who are bisexual. In uh, lesbian women, some 50% is uh, bisexual. And that explains why so many uh, women that marry and get children, uh, when the uh, marriage is breaking up, uh, they often uh, continue with a female friend. And then they say, well, she has become lesbian. That's nonsense. She was already bisexual from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But under pressure of the society, she made the easy choice to be uh, a mother of children. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, all, all those uh, things become more and more um, acceptable at this moment. At least Do in you... the Netherlands. Yeah, well, I... I... I, certainly, they're more acceptable now than they more more now than they ever were, even in the United States and probably in other parts of the world as well. Do you think is there um, is there a, do we have to wait until people die to really be able to, to to examine our brains, or will there be a moment in time when we can uh, monitor this level of brain activity without people having to be to die? <laughs> yeah, well, it is important. It's a very important question because at this moment, when children uh, come uh, to the clinics with uh, uh, gender identity problems, uh, we, we don't have any biological uh, means to check their story. Mm-hmm. So it would be wonderful if we could see by uh, advanced scanning techniques uh, whether they have female structures in male brains and the other way around. And we try this uh, on the basis of our research on postmortem uh, brains. And so mm-hmm. far, it's not possible to see those, uh, uh, those differences in uh, living people. But I'm sure that uh, the, the progress in, in advanced uh, scanning is such that uh, it, it will happen let's say, within the next 10 years or so. And then, of course, we would have a very good support of, uh, uh, of the story of, of people uh, and the story of children. Um, and that's, again, it, it's important because um, uh, when we look to the children that come with uh, gender identity uh, uh, problems, then uh, it's not a good prediction for um, uh, transsexuality, uh, some mm-hmm. only some 10, 20 percent of them go um, into the the, the whole um, train of events of, of transsexuality. It is a good prediction for homosexuality, but not for transsexuality. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it would be very nice if we could have a biological uh, way to to confirm the story and to. Uh, to tell uh, what direction it will take. I believe that we will have that technology in the future, um, maybe long mm-hmm. after anyone who's watching this video 
<laughs> is around, uh, but hopefully that will be finally for, for, for once put an end to uh, the, the fight and, and not the conversation, but an end to the, to the discrimination that a lot of people in these communities face. But in the meantime, we have uh, the work of scientists like you who have provided us some very life-saving um, information, whether it's something that's for the public to consume or even just sort of self-affirmation. Uh, I remember exactly where I was when I learned uh, of your work. I was in the subway reading the news on my phone. I was, it must have been five years ago, six, something like that. And I had discovered your work for the first time and um, was elated that there was valid, actual validation, proof, you know, because before that, at least in my world, it had all just been conjecture and people saying, oh, you think this, you know, and kind of yeah. at, at best placating and patronizing. Um, and so that's what's why your... I, that's yeah. why I also um, have written an, a book for a general public. It's called "We Are Our Brains," and one mm -hmm. of the things I have explained is about sexual differentiation of the brain. And I hope that this type of information will become uh, general knowledge and uh, help people uh, that feel uh, discriminated. It's the next book on my reading list. We are our brains. I am so thankful that I was able to sit down and have another conversation with you or have this conversation with you and that you were able to make time uh, for our for our viewers. I know there's a lot of people that are gonna wanna uh, dive into your work. I think, I guess we should start with We Are Our Brains so that no one gets overwhelmed with the world of neuroscience and brain biology. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, I wanted to say thank you so much for all that you have done. And just the fact that whether this was a curiosity or something that you were compelled to do, uh, it, it is absolutely life-saving. And I couldn't be more grateful. You're welcome. I did it with this pleasure. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you want to see more of Dr. Swab's presentation, uh, you can just Google and search the internet. But of course, we have a very special presentation from Dr. Swab on Black Queer Town Hall's YouTube. Uh, you can go even further and deeper into his research and work. And of course, here are some conversations from Black queer scientists and uh, their experiences, their everyday experiences in the lab and the world of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Thank you so much for watching. And please enjoy the rest of the talk.